sure there he is. So I don't know if we have to make Ajahn Ramali again co-host. Can you unmute yourself, Ajahn? Or is that not possible? Okay, so please can one of the co-hosts unmute Ajahn Ramali because he's now not co-host anymore. So you should get a message, Ajahn, that asks you to unmute yourself. And maybe Mel can make him okay. Great. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, shall we start? Great. So let's start. So uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the uh, uh, initially, the title of this retreat was simply uh, Why, which is kind of cryptic, but uh, it's a nice, nice one though, because it uh, sort of gets to the heart of the idea of causality. Everything has a why in Buddhism. Right? Nothing happens without a why, so it is very interesting in that way. But it's also a bit like a koan, a Zen koan, just why, why? <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and there are a few suttas even that are Cohen-like uh, that the Buddha that you find in the, among the four Nikayas. Uh, and I will look at a couple of those suttas later on because they're kind of interesting, they're different. Uh, I don't know if they are the inspiration behind the Cohen's that came later on or maybe similar kind of things. Uh, but it's kind of interesting because it makes you think about the Dhamma in a new way when you get things that are um, different like that. And have to kind of figure out what is going on here. So, but first of all, why? Where does this come from? What is the idea behind this? And as I mentioned before, this is something that uh, Ajahn Brahm came up with. Uh, and of course, I think it refers back to uh, the idea of Ajahn Brahm, uh, you know, the famous story that he tells very often uh, when he met with Ajahn Shah. Uh, Ajahn Shah went off to the sauna, and then while he was in the sauna, Ajahn Brahm sat and did some meditation, and he had some very nice meditation. And then after he came out of his meditation, he then uh, saw Ajahn Shah coming out of the sauna. So he meant to meet Ajahn Shah. And then Ajahn Shah, of course, being you know, the great meditation master, uh, having the ability to take one look at people and know pretty much exactly where they're at, uh, he, he looked at Ajahn Brahm and he said to Ajahn Brahm, why? <laughs> Yeah, what do you do when a big meditation master looks at you and says, why, what do you, what do you say here? And Ajahn Brahm, I think he was a bit stunned. They didn't know why, what am I supposed to say to why? It's a bit too strange. Uh, and of course, then Ajahn Shah says, there is nothing. Yeah, there is nothing is then the reply to the question why. Yeah. And of course, the story is that Ajahn, he then said to Ajahn Brahm, do you understand it? Ajahn Brahm kind of nodded, and Ajahn Shah said, no, you, no, you don't. Uh, and so obviously, this is a profound thing that is going on here in this conversation, shortly the conversation between Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Shah. So what exactly is going on there? What is this thing? What is this why question? What does it actually mean? What is it trying to get at? Why, what exactly? Uh, and uh, I think you can look at this from a number of different angles. Uh, but uh, one obvious angle is that Ajahn Shah could tell that Ajahn Brahm had a good meditation. Yeah. So the obvious why is, well, why was the meditation good? What was your success in meditation? Yeah, what actually happened in this meditation? This is the obvious thing. Yeah. So, um, uh, and, um, So how does that answer the question there? Why, why does there is nothing answer that question about good meditation practice? What is the connection there between the two? Then? And uh, I think the obvious answer is that meditation happens when you let go. Meditation happens when there is no sense of self. Yeah, there's nothing there which kind of gets in the way for meditation to happen. It is always, the, not always, but usually the the doing of the mind and the, um, you know, all the activities that we produce, the sense of self which wants to 
defends itself, you want to be somebody, you want to have an identity, and all of these kind of things. And this is what often blocks our ability to meditate. So why? Why is the meditation good? And the answer is, well, when you let go of that sense of self, if not completely, at least partially, then the result of that is that meditation starts to happen. I think this is a very important part of what is going on here. So um, that's kind of fascinating, right? It's a, it's a very it's a profound search, a, a profound idea about letting go of the sense of self, which really is happening here. But I think there's also another aspect to this, and this is kind of the maybe the larger picture of why, uh, and that is the picture, the thing that we're going to come to in a in a second uh, when we start looking at the suttas in a in a few moments, uh, and that is the why of suffering here. Uh, yeah, why is there suffering here? Why are we in this predicament? Why are we here in the first place? Yeah, and that the answer to that question is actually very similar to the answer of the question of why is meditation going well? The answer is that there is no one really in charge. There's no one who can control the world to make the world happy, to make the world just right. And we should kind of get that after a while, but because we always try and it never really works out. But somehow we can't get that. We don't really, the penny never really drops that the reason why we can't get it right is because we are not really in control. Control is outside of our grasp. And this again is related to this idea of non-self. We are not in charge. There's no sense, there's no one here who has the ability to kind of work these conditions out in such a way that we can be happy whenever we want to and we don't have to suffer when we don't want to. It doesn't work like that. So if it doesn't work like that, well, how exactly does it work? Why do we suffer in this world? And the answer, of course, is because of conditionality. And that conditionality is expressed in Buddhism through dependent origination. Yeah, that is basically the teaching about why suffering arises in the world. And if you understand dependent origin, origination in the right way, then you will also realize that that teaching includes a very a profound statement on non-self, which is actually embedded in that teaching here. It shows conditionality and it shows conditionality in such a way here, that it actually precludes the idea of a self. The self is kind of banished from dependent origination. It causes all the way down. Yeah, it's like turtles all the way down, or whatever they say. This, this causes all the way down. There's no end to the causes, going back and back in time to the as far as it would like to go. And there's nothing there which is inherent to this process that carries on through it. So that is the answer, and that is why this is interesting. Why it plays into what we are going to talk about now. So uh, suffering, yeah? So uh, uh, we're going to talk about suffering and its causes, and then we're going to talk about the solution. The solution is going to be the most part of this retreat, but to set the scene for the solution, I want to talk about the problem, first of all. And uh, the very first little extract of suttas that I have uh, chosen here, which is part of the sutta that was sent out to everyone. This is the short extract, the standard definition of suffering in the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, this very first sutta here, you can see if you have it in front of you, it has SN 56.11. And 56, SN is the Sanyutta Nikaya, the connected discourses of the Buddha. 56 is the chapter, if you like, and 11 is the sutta number. And this is the very famous sutta on the setting in motion, the wheel of the Dhamma, yeah? traditionally regarded as the first sutta of the Buddha spoke. And for that reason, very interesting, because you can imagine that the very first sutta is where the Buddha kind of lays down the ground plan for what the Dhamma is about. Now he's going to express his new discovery for the first time, and is going to obviously express that in a way that is meaningful for a first-time audience. So it's easy to understand what this teaching is, is about. So this obviously is very special. Um, I should say that the translation that I have here is a translation by uh, Bhante Sujato. Uh, so it's a little bit different from 
maybe what you are used to if you're used to Wikibody's translations. Uh, but uh, I think it's nice to kind of vary translations a little bit. Uh, so I thought it would be uh, nice to have a look at this translation for once uh, and uh, to see we'll take it from there. So this is the setting in motion the wheel of the Dharma and this is the first noble truth, the noble truth of suffering. Yeah? So how does the Buddha define suffering? So I'll uh, read this out to you and then I will comment on this in a bit of detail in a, in a minute. Uh, so rebirth is suffering, and old age is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering, and association with the disliked is suffering, and separation from the liked is suffering, and not getting what you wish for is suffering. And in brief, the five grasping aggregates, the Panchupadana Kanda, are suffering. Yeah. Yeah, this is the standard exposition of the first noble truth. I'm sure you've heard it many, many times before. But uh, these are the kind of teachings that really are worthy of a lot of contemplation. Because what you will find is that these things can be seen in many different layers and many different degrees, many different depths. And it's always good to try to see these things in a slightly deeper way. So let's consider this. Uh, uh, briefly. So first of all, we have the idea that rebirth uh, is suffering. Uh, yeah, which is uh, maybe you are used to the translation birth uh, is suffering. Uh, here we have rebirth is suffering. Uh, does it make a difference? Uh, is which is one more right than the other? Uh, and uh, uh, the answer is that I think rebirth is actually a more appropriate translation than just birth. Uh, because it is important to realize that when you translate the suttas, you should really try to put yourself in the mind of the people in ancient India. How did they understand these words? Yeah. And of course, in ancient India, the idea of birth always implied rebirth. There's no such thing as birth without rebirth. So when they heard these words, they would have a different meaning from what they would have to us. So even though the Pali word jati really can be translated quite, fi quite fine as, as birth, uh, the implication for the audience would always have been rebirth. Uh, so if you want to get the meaning out of these things, uh, you have to put yourself in the mind of the people who heard these teachings uh, and translate the meaning rather than be too concerned about the literal, uh, literalness of the word. Uh, so I think rebirth is appropriate in this context. Of course, it, it kind of adds something very important uh, to this whole idea of suffering. Rebirth is suffering is one of the big themes in the whole of Buddhist teachings. Yeah, the idea of carrying on, moving on from life to life. In fact, it is specifically said elsewhere in the suttas uh, that rebirth is suffering, freedom from rebirth is happiness. Uh, it's one of those fundamental teachings in the suttas. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of one of the main themes. Uh, whereas birth is suffering, Yes, we can make sense of that. Of course, there's a lot of, no doubt, it's painful to get born as well. But rebirth is suffering fits much better with the whole kind of general thrust, if you like, of the Dhamma, the way it is presented in the suttas. And also, it makes very good sense because the idea is to overcome suffering. What is the kind of birth we can overcome? Obviously, it is future birth. We cannot overcome the birth that happened in this life. Too late, we're in this mess already. Yeah, I can't get out of this mess. So now it is the future mess that we have to deal with. So let's see if we can do something with that future mess instead. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that because I think that is a theme that most of you will be quite familiar with. Then we have the idea that old age is suffering, yeah, which kind of makes, makes sense. I think, again, I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Um, Uh, then we have idea of illness is suffering, yeah, and uh, you all know the idea, of course, that illness is suffering, and, and uh, I, I always like the, and, and this is a very useful way of thinking about it, and this, I always say this on these retreats, and maybe it's probably all you heard it umpteen times before, yeah? but this is that nice way that Adam Brown puts the idea of illness is suffering, yeah, when you go to the doctor because you are sick, yeah? And instead of saying to the doctor, oh, doctor, something is wrong with me, I'm sick today. Instead, you should say, doctor, doctor, something is right with me. I'm sick again today. 
And uh, <laughs> that is the right way to think about it. And it's a beautiful way of turning around the perception because actually, from a Buddhist point of view, that is far more accurate, it's far more to the point, yeah? That this is a problem that we always carry with us. Uh, and for that reason, it is something that is not really unexpected or surprising. Yeah? And if you get into that kind of way of thinking uh, that nothing is wrong when you have uh, illness, uh, it actually t tends to say something about life, about the na nature of suffering uh, and about the nature of the solution to that problem. Uh, so it is a very useful way of thinking about it, yeah? Because if suffering is inevitable, if nothing has gone wrong when you are ill, <coughs> then of course it means that the solution to the problem is not to try to stop being ill completely, because that is impossible. The solution to the problem lies somewhere else. It probably lies on the spiritual path or something like that, because it cannot lie in overcoming all illness. It's impossible. It's part and parcel of what it means to be a human being. Yeah? But uh, the interesting one, the one I really want to talk about is the last one, because it summarizes uh, all of the previous ones in a very nice way. Uh, and this is that death uh, is suffering. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm sure you can all relate to that to some way that death is suffering. Uh, I think it is probably fairly obviously the case. Uh, and um, so the question is, uh, Uh, what do we make of this death being suffering? Yeah? In what sense is death suffering? Yeah? And the very first way that death is suffering, obviously, yeah, is that it is so unknown. We don't know what's going to happen when we pass away. Yeah? Are we just going to disappear into nothingness like many people contend? That? Is it going to be the end of everything? Are we going to be annihilated or extinguished when we pass away? Yeah? And maybe that would be a good idea, but maybe that's too simple. Yeah, maybe that's just too easy to be extinguished just like that. Maybe we have to work for our extinguishment, uh, to put it another way. Uh, is it bad to be extinguished? Uh, maybe not. Uh, some people in this world that long to be extinguished because they find life so difficult. Uh, so uh, that is a matter of perspective, uh, whether it is bad or not. Uh, but uh, let's not go too far down that track yet. Yeah. The alternative, of course, is that you might get reborn, perhaps, yeah, after you pass away. And of course, the problem with being reborn is that we just don't know what's going to happen. Where are you going to be reborn? What are you going to be reborn as? Are you going to be human? Are you going to be something else? So there's all of this uncertainty with dying. And this is one of the kind of great problems with death, is the uncertainty that we are facing here. And... Um, one of the things that is kind of, I think, interesting here is how can we deal with that basic uncertainty of dying? How can we reduce that fear? How can we minimize that to make it less kind of, the, you know, that we come to this kind of barrier. Death is like this barrier, this wall beyond which you have no idea what is there. Is there a precipice there? Is there a beautiful mountain? Are we, what, what is happening once we go beyond that kind of boundary, which is death? How can we resolve some of that now so that we don't have to have that fear? It's one of those interesting things in life that although most people in the world, they have some degree of fear of death, there are some people who don't have any fear of death. What kind of people is that? And one of the things that you may have noticed in your own life is that, I don't know, I certainly noticed that, is that when you have a lot of benevolence to the world, when you have a lot of meta, when you have a lot of kindness towards the people around you, it actually reduces the fear of death. Have you seen that? The more uh, happy you feel inside, the more kind of a, a broad sense of compassion and the kindness you have for the world, the, the sense of death actually starts to die down. And uh, those people in my life who, who I have met who claim to have no fear of death whatsoever, uh, there are also people who have these incredibly large hearts, uh, hearts of enormous compassion, of enormous kindness. Uh, yeah? And uh, this is what you, it, it fits exactly what you find in the suttas. Uh, in the suttas, the Buddha says that someone who has a lot of metta and a lot of kindness in them uh, is someone who has no fear of death. Uh, death kind of, that, that thing is basically uh, abolished in them, that kind of fear. Uh. So if you want to reduce uh, the fear of dying, uh, the obvious thing that we should do is simply to be more kind. The kinder you are to the world, 
uh, the better you feel about yourself, the more metta you have for others, the more happy you feel inside. Uh, and as a consequence, there is almost like an intuition uh, that arises inside of you uh, that dying is not really fearful anymore. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's almost as if you can do it. Uh, and whatever comes on the other side uh, is going to be positive. It's going to be happy. Uh, it's going to be something that you can enjoy. Uh, it's not like an intuition, but a very powerful intuition, an intuition that sort of sits very deep inside of us. The feeling of metta is almost, it counteracts fear, it counteracts anxiety of any kind, and also the anxiety of death. So if you want to counteract that, practice more metta, practice more kindness in your life. And as you do that, you will start to alleviate this kind of fear that we, most people are carrying with them. So this is one side of the problem, and this is really the way to contemplate that and also to resolve that to some extent. But um, of course, death is more than just the fear of the unknown. It is also the fear of all the things that we are going to lose. Yeah, all the attachments that we have in this life, uh, they're all going to be challenged absolutely and fully when you are at death's door, you're on your deathbed, you're bound to pass away. Yeah. And those attachments are manifold. Yeah, they are, of course, our attachment to our possessions, our attachments to all the relationships that we have. Yeah, and then you have a, your attachments to your identity. So much of our identity is tied up with this particular existence. Yeah, your gender, your education, your social status, all of these kind of things, your nationality, all of these things are tied up with the uh, this existence right here and now, and all of that uh, is going to be taken away from you, it's going to be challenged uh, when you are about to pass away. And that, of course, makes death very kind of uh, worrisome. Yeah? The more we identify with the things of the world, the more attachments we have with this world, the more problematic the dying process is going to be. Uh, and one of the interesting things here is that this whole idea of being attached to things and giving things up uh, is very similar to the problems we face in meditation practice. Yeah, in meditation, one of the, you know, the attachments that stop you from going deeper uh, are precisely things that uh, you know, have to do with this world. Uh, the more you, you think about the things of this world because you are attached to them, uh, all of that is going to stop you from going deep yeah, in your meditation practice, uh, and including your sense of identity. Uh, who are you? Uh, yeah, all of these things that block you and you start thinking about them. Sometimes you want that identity to come back. And because you fear losing your identity, that sense of attachment to who you are encourages often thinking in the meditation practice. And of course, that becomes a serious problem. So the idea, what happens when you die and what happens when you have su success in meditation practice, these two things are very closely related to each other. And that is why the idea of death can be so useful in meditation practice, because it leans the mind in the right direction. It leans the mind towards letting go, yeah, of, of obviously of all the things that we own in this world, of our relationships, but even of our sense of who we are, even our sense of identity starts to fade in meditation practice, yeah. And uh, so using the idea of death and using that contemplation can actually encourage you to go deeper in meditation practice. And it's surprisingly beautiful. Yeah, I, you know, we cherish our identity so much. Uh, and very often we take pr pride, yeah, we take pride in our nationality, or we take pride in our, our accomplishments in this world. And it's okay to do that to some extent. Yeah, I shouldn't kind of discourage this completely. Yeah? But uh, it certainly certainly becomes a problem when you go deeper in meditation, because if you attach too much to those things, uh, then it becomes really problematic. Yeah? And what you find is that when you give up these things, uh, when you give up that sense of identity, uh, and you kind of feel what that feels like by going through a death meditation or whatever it is, uh, it just feels so delightful. Not just delightful, but there is an emptiness that comes with that. Uh, we feel empty inside. Uh, yeah? You are no longer male or female. Uh, you're no longer, I don't know, Norwegian yeah, or, or British or Australian or, or, or whatever else it is that you might be. Yeah? All of those things don't really apply anymore. Yeah? 
you're no longer educated or uneducated. There's this beautiful sense of emptiness inside. And all that is left in that empty mind inside, as you give up these things, because you know that they block your meditation practice, all that is left is this beautiful state of peace. And if you encourage the meditation in the right way, that peace is imbued with delight, with joy, and, and all the other beautiful aspects of meditation instead. So it's extraordinarily powerful. Yeah? And when you start to see this, you start to understand that this whole idea of identity, of being someone, yeah? and which is so much encouraged in our culture. You've got to be somebody. You've got to create an identity for yourself. Be proud of what you have done. Work hard. Create a sense of self that is marvelous or whatever. All of that is really so misguided. It is misguided because there is something far more powerful in this world, far more beautiful, than, which is the emptiness inside it. And this emptiness inside, you can encourage through the death contemplation. Uh, then bring that death contemplation into your ordinary meditation practice, uh, and you will find that you move more easily to emptiness, uh, to the mind which doesn't think, which doesn't uh, proliferate endlessly about all kinds of things, revolving around the sense of self, revolving around cravings, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so um, if we use uh, the death contemplation in this way, uh, it can become a very beautiful and powerful tool in encouraging the meditation in the right direction. But uh, it is much more than that. Uh, death contemplation, yes, it can be useful in meditation, but it is also useful as one of the very uh, foundational aspects of the Buddhist path that starts us out in the right way, makes us reflect about the world in the right way, and guides us not only in meditation, but in everything that we do. Yeah, day-to-day -day life, uh, if you remember that you're going to die, yeah, what happens? Well, what happens is that you start to treat people in a new way. Yeah. If I knew that tonight was the last time I was going to see you, yeah, all of you, yeah, yeah when the Botanda and every one of you, how, what would I do? Would I treat you badly if it's the last time I was going to see you? Yeah. Of course not. Yeah. I would want to have a nice, pleasant goodbye, say goodbye to everyone in a positive way, because it is just terrible to die with a heavy heart, filled with a sense of perhaps remorse and regret, and perhaps a sense of guilt because you have been silly, because you've acted in a bad way. So the idea of death actually makes us better people. It reminds us of the importance of living well in the here and now. It reminds us that there is, you can never really afford to have any enemies in this world, because death might come just around the corner. It makes you a more positive person, a better person as a consequence. I was just leading a funeral a couple of days ago. And uh, at this funeral service, usually when I do these services, I usually tell that story, that uh, another story from Ajahn Brahm. And this is a story from Thailand again, the story of Ajahn Shah, and the famous story where Ajahn Shah holds up a glass there's a large assembly sitting in front of Ajahn Shah. And he shows the glass to the assembly. And he says to the assembly, can you see the crack in this glass? I'm sure many of you, maybe all of you, will know this story already, but I'm going to tell it again anyway. <laughs> can you see the crack in this glass? And the audience looks at the glass. What? Why are you getting senile, Ajahn Shah? That's a perfectly fine glass. There is no crack in that glass. Ajahn Shah says, no, there is a crack in that glass. Because we know this being a glass, one day it will fall down on the concrete, fall down on the tiles or whatever it is, on a hard surface somewhere. And when a glass falls down on a hard surface, it shatters into a thousand pieces. Why? Because that is the nature of a glass. A glass tends to end in shattering in a thousand pieces. So what does that mean? And what it means is that we care for the glass. We are careful. We put it down gently on a soft surface somewhere. We don't just smash it in the floor because if we smash it in the floor, it will shatter again in a thousand pieces. We care for it so that that crack, which is already there, does not become apparent if, um, until the time that it has to become apparent. We make it last as long as we possibly can. And of course, the idea here, the simile here, is that human life is fragile as well. We are all fragile, yeah. This human body that we have is so uncertain. We have no idea how long it's going to last. Maybe there is a cancer working on the surface right here, right now. 
I have two family members who have died of cancer. And could I be next? Of course, I could be next. Absolutely. Yeah. They might be working in here right now. I have no idea. Yeah. And because of this fragility of the human body, yeah, yeah because everyone is the same, yeah, it makes us care for each other yeah, because we understand that is the right thing to do yeah, when life is so fragile. Yeah. And it's a beautiful story to, uh, again, remind us of the importance of uh, the death contemplation, the fragility of life, uh, and what that means for us. It means that we become more caring, more kind, more compassionate, uh, more understanding of the people around us. Uh, and if that is what the death contemplation does to us, uh, does to us uh, then wow, it is so powerful. Yeah, it's so, so incredibly useful. But the full power of the death contemplation, to me, really comes out in the life story of the Buddha himself. And that is the story which I, I find so fascinating in so many ways, because one of the things that I think is really understood is that the very foundation of Buddhism, the very reason why we have Buddhism today, is because one person two and a half thousand years ago contemplated death in a very profound way. And you may remember the life story of the Buddha, where the Buddha before Actually, this is the Buddha to be, yeah, before his awakening, yeah, and he's contemplating life, and you find this in the suttas in a few places, uh, and he contemplates specifically about death, yeah, it, it, it is, it is, there's also mention of illness and old age, yeah, but death is like the thing that summarizes all of these things in one go, huh? yeah, and you find this in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, Magic Manikaya 26, the middle length sayings of the Buddha, it is all there, huh? And uh, the Buddha to be, he reflects, yeah, I myself am going to die. I myself have this problem for the future. And of course, death is problematic. Does it make sense for me who is going to die to accumulate other things that are also going to die? <coughs> what are those other things that are going to die? Well, first and foremost, family members, yeah, wife, children, whatever else it might be, or if you are a woman, a husband and children, perhaps, yeah, and then he reflects what, and all the other things as well have to die in a metaphorical sense, all the things I own are going to disappear eventually, they have to die when I die, yeah, they have to go, in that sense they are problematic, yeah? so if I am going to die, if I have this problem, does it make sense for me to attach to all these other things that are have exactly the same problem to them. This was the Buddha's Buddha to be thinking before he passed away. And those were the thoughts that actually made, made him decide to become a renunciant, to leave the household life, and to practice meditation to the best of his ability. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? It's such a simple idea. It's something that we are all faced with at all all times we all know that we're going to have to die here and yet we don't make that logical conclusion there's a very serious problem here you have to have some very special personal characteristics to be able to draw the full consequences of such a simple truth and of course it took a buddha or someone who was on the path to becoming a buddha to see this and then based on this idea of dying which was kind of staring in his face he decides to go forth he becomes a monk he practices uh, for six or seven years or whatever it is. Uh, and then as a consequence of that practice, he finds a solution to the problem of death. Uh, which is kind of amazing, isn't it? When you think about it, finding a solution to the problem of death. Uh, it's a kind of the audacity of that. Uh, the audacity of saying death is a problem. I'm going to find a solution to this. Uh, leaving the house of life, going out and practicing on your own. Uh, there's something just uh, astonishing about that. Uh, and uh, that is when you realize it takes a kind of a pretty remarkable person to be able to even embark on that journey because it is a, it's just a mind boggling, the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, mind that is required to see these sort of things clearly. Yeah. So the Buddha then practiced to the end, he found a solution to the, pro to the problem of dying, yeah, of course, which is the ending of rebirth. If you don't have rebirth, uh, then you cannot die again in the future, yeah? And then uh, that is the solution, and it comes back, yeah? and it teaches the world about this problem, this thing that he, he, was, uh, he um, had found. 
And uh, later on, when he started tries to teach uh, this Dhamma to people, uh, he, in a sense, um, draws, I think, on some of the thoughts that he had before his own awakening, uh, how he was thinking about this. Uh, and one of those beautiful similes that you find in the suttas where the Buddha is talking about, you know, life and the problem of life uh, and uh, how, when we are faced with death, uh, why it is problematic is a simile of the borrowed goods that you find in the, the next sutta here. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mix the suttas up a little bit as I, as I go along here. And uh, the simile of the borrowed goods is one of the similes that I always talk about on these kind of retreats because it is a very powerful way of thinking about the worldly possessions we have, the relationships we have, even the sense of identity we have, uh, is to remember that all of these things are borrowed. Uh, we have them for a while, and sometimes that while is very short, uh, and then we have to give it up. We have to give it back to nature, uh, because nature always reclaims these things. Uh. And the simile of the borrowed goods goes as follows. Uh, it is a simile of a uh, a man who borrows, it's a man who borrows a carriage and earrings. And then after borrowing this carriage and earrings, then he travels around, yeah, with a big carriage. This is kind of status symbols in ancient India. Now you have a high, you're a high status person because you have this beautiful jewelry and a big carriage with probably nice horses drawing you around. And then people see you and say, wow, look, this is a rich man. This is how they how the wealthy enjoy their wealth, yeah? And of course, if other people look at you and they say, wow, look at that, then of course, you start to identify with that. You identify with your wealth, yeah? And uh, because you identify with it, you cling to it, you become attached to these things. So. But because they are borrowed goods, uh, it doesn't take long before the lenders come. Uh, and when the lenders come, they say, okay, thank you very much. You've had this for long enough. We are gonna take back our goods. Uh. So how, how do you feel? If in the meantime, you have attached to these things, uh, if these things have become part of your identity, this is me, yeah, I am the wealthy person. I am really super important because I am wealthy. And now all the people that come back and take it away from you, uh, how do you feel? And you feel quite terrible. You feel naked. You feel like, uh, you know, some people do these days, you want to jump off the nearest skyscraper because your identity has been so challenged by the fact that you are no longer wealthy, that you cannot even live with yourself anymore. So this is the idea of the borrowed goods, yeah? And we all, everything we have in our lives are exactly the same. They are all borrowed goods. We have them for a while and then they have to go again. Everything has to go, yeah? When you die, all your possessions, all your relationships, your sense of identity, your body, how much effort, how much time, how much money, how much resources are we going to put into things that are just borrowed? A nice way to think about this is to think about uh, renting something, uh, renting a car, maybe renting an apartment or something uh, for a short time, maybe for a couple of months. Uh, yeah? If you rent something for a couple of months, uh, if you have a car that you drive for maybe a week or two, uh, how much effort are you going to put into that? How much effort are you going to put in refurbishing that apartment, making it nice, lots of paint work, and maybe remodeling it or whatever it is that you, uh, you would like to do, man. Very little, because you only have it for a short time. Man. You treat it nicely, you treat it well, because that is what people do uh, when, they live in, uh, when they live in the right way. Uh, but you don't put an enormous amount of effort into it. Uh, instead, you think of the long term. Yeah? You save your money, because maybe after renting his apartment, I can buy a house. So you save up the money instead of using it for a short-term project. And then when you maybe have finished renting that apartment, then you can buy your own apartment down the track. Because now you have saved up enough, you have enough capital to do that. And our life is like that. All the things that we have in this life are borrowed. Are you able to think about all the things that you think you own as borrowed goods instead? Are you able to think of your house, your apartment, your things, uh, everything you own as borrowed goods? Uh, try to reflect on your house, your apartment as something you're just renting for a short while uh, instead of something that you're owning. Uh, remember the idea of ownership is a delusion. Uh, it is a, it's not reality. Uh, nature is in charge. Uh, it will be taken away from you. Uh, 
So why buy into that non-reality when you know it is actually false? It is so obviously false. So you withdraw some of your interest, not all your interest, because that would also be wrong. We still look after the rental department. We still do what is right, but we don't put so much energy into it. We don't make it kind of the center point of what our life is all about. We withdraw some of the interest in our identity because our identity is also just borrowed for a short time. Are you male and female? Doesn't matter all that much. What is your national background? Actually, it doesn't matter all that much. Are you educated or uneducated? Again, it doesn't really matter. All of these things aren't superficial. They are related specifically to this life. It is an identity that only makes sense because of the institutions and all the networks that we are living under in this particular life. Take away those institutions and social networks and all of these things, and these things are meaningless. It is not something you can take with you into the future. And so think about all of these things as borrowed. Why are we holding on to these borrowed things? Let them go. Enjoy the emptiness inside instead. And you will actually discover something which is far more beautiful, far more powerful, far more worthy of being attached to. But of course, you don't attach so much to those things. That is the beautiful thing. You withdraw your interest from all of that. And of course, the corollary of all of this is that you also have to reflect on what is it actually that you do own? What is the one thing that we own in this world? And the Buddha gives the answer in the suttas. It is karma. It is the mind that we make in this life. And that mind is built up, it is made up not out of external things, out of the attachments that we have in the world, out of the identity we have, but it's made up out of kindness, out of caring, out of compassion, out of sympathy for the world around us and also for ourselves. That is what it is made up of. And the more we can practice that goodness of the heart and take that with us into the future, the more we build up something inside of us that is solid that we can take with us also into the future. Probably for the long term, not only one life, but life after life. This is something that tends to last over very long terms of time. Of course, in the end, even kamma is not really yours. Even kamma must eventually wear out, but it is much more yours than all of these worldly things. So that means that your investment strategy changes. Yeah, when you remember death, when you remember the borrowed goods of the world, we don't invest in them so much anymore. All of these things around me are borrowed. Yeah, so you invest in something else. And that investing in something else, in karma, is investing in kindness, in generosity, in all of the positive things I just mentioned a minute ago. That is what we invest in. It may sound very callous. It may sound very cold to say not to invest in our relationships. But what I mean by investing, not investing in our relationships, I mean not attaching too much. I don't mean we shouldn't be kind. Of course we should be kind, because that is what karma is precisely about. So the beautiful outcome of this is not that we become cold to the world around us. In fact, exactly the opposite. Instead of trying to manipulate the world around us, manipulate the people around us, we turn around, we become kind to the world instead. And somehow this idea of practicing the spiritual way or looking for the long-term benefit, it also benefits our life right here and right now because we become better people. The other idea of investing in people, investing in goods, it leads to attachments. And when you attach too much, when you hold on to the world, and all of you probably know this at least to some extent, when you attach to things, that is when you make mistakes. That is when you get angry. That's when you get greedy because you want to hold on to the things in the world. But if you let go of that, if you have more perspective on what is going on, that is where true kindness, true metta, true love, true compassion becomes possible because you have a clarity about what is going on. And that then becomes the power of the death contemplation. So um, uh, that is uh, uh, the idea of uh, the death contemplation for you. So please, uh, I would really 
recommend you to try out this uh, death contemplation because it is a fundamental part of the Buddhist path. Uh, the Buddha talks about this in a number of suttas. Uh, and one of the things is that he recommends it, that you try to kind of bring the idea of death uh, quite close to yourself. Yeah, Maybe it can happen quite soon. Yeah, What if you're going to die next year? How do you feel about that? Uh, what if it is next month? What if it is in a week's time? What if it is tomorrow? Yeah? And you try to bring it closer because the closer it is, if you are aware that the potential of dying is ever present, that is when it starts to have a powerful effect on your mind. Yeah? If it is always at the back of your mind, if it always informs you right here and right now, that is where it starts to have an impact on your behavior in the present. Because you remember, if I can die, well, there's only one thing to be done, and that is to be kind. It is to uh, care for people in the right way. Yeah. There is a beautiful sutta which just comes to mind now when I'm talking about this, and that is the uh, sutta with uh, King Pasena, the of course, one of the great kings of the time of the Buddha. And uh, he went to the Buddha very often and would always ask the Buddha lots of questions and lots of suttas between King Pasenadi and the Buddha. And uh, he, one day he comes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha that um, um, uh, he talks about his problems in governing or all, all this, but they're just arguing and kind of causing problems and all kinds of things, you know. And he, uh, he says to the, and he says to the Buddha, what, what shall we do? You know, what, what shall we, I can't remember exactly how it goes now, but uh, he talks to the Buddha anyway. And then the Buddha, says to him that, well, what you should do, the right way to reflect is, is like this. Imagine that there is a mountain, yeah, there's a man coming from the south, and this man coming from the south is like your messenger or your guard or something, and he tells you that there is a mountain coming towards you from the south. And this mountain which is coming towards you from the south, it is enormous, obviously. It is crushing all living beings as it is moving from the south towards you. Another man comes from the west and says exactly the same thing. There's a mountain coming from the west, moving towards you, crushing all living beings in its path. Another mountain coming from the north. Another mountain coming from the east, all moving in on you. And then the Buddha says to King Pasenadi, if that is the case, if there is a mountain coming in this way, what would you do, great king? And King Pasena said, well, if that were the case, what can I do except to do what is good and to make merit and to live well? And the Buddha says to King Pasena, I inform you, great king, I tell you, life, uh, death is coming from all these directions, uh, crushing everything in his path, and it's aiming right for you. Yeah, just like that mountain there. And uh, then the Buddha says, well, what would you do? And of course, the king ask, answers in exactly the same way. Well, if that is the case, what can I do except to live good and to do what is right? There's a great little uh, conversation between the Buddha. The Buddha, the suttas are full of these kind of nice little conversations between uh, King Pasenadi and the Buddha and all other kind of beings in this way. And it kind of uh, uh, brings home the message in a very sort of uh, uh, familiar and um, personal fashion when you, when you read these things. So, so uh, make much of the uh, death contemplation, especially if you are at ease with it. If it is difficult for you to uh, use it, then uh, be gentle with yourself, of course. Uh, all of these things in the Buddha's teachings, they are there to make you feel better not to make you feel worse. And if you find things difficult, it means that you haven't found maybe quite the right approach to these things yet. Maybe you have to wait a little bit down the track. But in the long run, I think you will find that this actually works and it actually will give you a lot of benefit if you do this in the right way. So that is a little bit about the death contemplation. Um, Uh, Jan, would it be a good time for some questions now, or would you like to yeah. continue? I think that's a good idea. I think it's good to stop there. If I start something more, we're going to get into trouble. So please, yeah, let's do some questions there. Okay, great. Yeah. 
I think we only have one so far. So just for everyone else, if you do have something from Ajahn Brahmali or anything you'd like to reflect back, please write them to Derek, Q&A Derek, and, uh, and I shall try to include as many as possible. So the first question we have here is, Dear Ajahn, can we say that letting go is very similar to losing the interest for things? Uh, letting go is similar to losing the interest uh, uh, for things. Uh, yes, it is very, very, very similar um, because uh, you know what you. The whole point, kind of letting go, is that you understand that things are suffering. Yeah, things are problematic. This is kind of the whole point of the insight of the Buddha is to see the suffering in the world. And of course, when you see suffering, you lose your interest in those things that are, are suffering. So very, very much so. So the, the, the thing though is to try to let go and to see this in a gradual fashion, not to do it too fast. And I know sometimes people try to kind of hurry things up and they try to contemplate everything as suffering in one go. All existence is suffering, everything is just terrible. And then they end up depressed and sad and they can't carry on. And uh, I have sometimes met people who have been so contemplated maybe the Dhamma in the wrong way without doing it gradually, kind of taking, lumping everything together. Everything is just terrible. And then uh, as a consequence of that, they have ended up um, being precisely depressed and sad and suicidal, not seeing the purpose in life. And they're often just lying in bed all day, not really being able to do anything because of that. So you have to do it gradually. And uh, the gradual way of uh, thinking about suffering, the very first one, uh, yeah, the way to start, I would say, is to start with morality and is to understand the suffering of being immoral, yeah, of, being, of living in the wrong way. And uh, that already is actually incredibly useful. If you can make a lot of that idea that uh, doing the wrong thing uh, is suffering not just for yourself, but also for others. Uh, if you can make that very clear in your mind, uh, then of course it becomes far, far easier to live a moral and good life uh, as a consequence. Very often the reason why we do bad things, uh, the reason why we say things to people that are not very nice, uh, the reason why we might even, even just thinking about, thought about somebody, is because we think that it is useful in a certain way. We think that it will lead to some kind of happiness. Yeah? If I tell them off, then they will change their ways and then things will get better as a consequence. But usually it doesn't work like that. And especially if that telling off comes from ill will and anger and all kind of negative states, it is really, really problematic. So it is very important to remember the power of kindness, to understand that it always leads to happiness both for yourself and also for others. And one of the things that I, uh, you know, one of the definitions of, if you like, the spiritual life, uh, of, um, uh, which I have always liked to use, is that any action or speech or thought is spiritual, or it's Buddhist, if you like, it, if it is beneficial both for yourself and for others. So, yeah, if it is good for yourself and for others, then you know it is a spiritual act. And that is the things that we should do. If it is only good for yourself, well, then it's kind of selfish. If it's only good for the other, well, then it's like you are sacrificing yourself for others, perhaps. Yeah, it should really be good for both. And it's a truly spiritual act. So look for that. And if you look for that, then you will uh, find that you are, you know, you, you let go of the and negative things because you understand the suffering in actually doing the negative things and you do the good things because you understand the happiness of that and then gradually you take it further yeah you start off with the idea of morality and if that doesn't work and once you kind of get that established then you start to understand the world as problematic yeah because the more you understand that the world is inherently problematic the more easy it is to let go and of course the great thing about that is that you can access something better. Yeah, this is kind of the whole point. The point is not just to kind of be sad about the world disappearing. The whole point is to get access to something more. That is kind of what this is all about. So, and, it is, and this is one of the, you know, the great benefits of the COVID situation. It's one of the great benefits of sometimes reading about the news about the world, yeah, about what politicians do in the world and about 
climate change and about pollution and about uh, you know the the kind of the sable saber saber rattling between uh, uh, different nations all of this kind of thing this kind of feeling that the world is really out of control yeah we have we don't really know what's going to happen in the world next uh, you know we see the military regimes taking over in countries like Myanmar and, uh, we see kind of autocrats coming to power but where is this heading here and we just don't know I'm not saying that it necessarily is all bad uh, it isn't. It's kind of always a mixed bag, but it's always so uncertain. It is always so unreliable. We have no idea. We have this hope in our hearts that the world is going in the right direction. But that hope is so often thwarted. We just have no idea what is really going to happen. So we have to be realistic about that world. And we have to be realistic about where real happiness can be found. And that, of course, is inside away from that world, the place where you have a degree of control, yeah? So again, this is where you, uh, where you let go, and you let go of all of that, and as you uh, contemplate in the right way, it allows you that uh, letting go. It comes from understanding the problem of suffering uh, in the world, uh, and then gradually it uh, moves in that direction. And over time, we take it even deeper, yeah? Over time, it goes to even more profound levels, uh, this is where we come into the idea of non-self, where you give up things all the way to the core, yeah, understanding the problems that a sense of self creates. The sense of self creates enormous problems in our lives because it is the foundation for all attachments. All attachments emanate from the sense of self. So all the problems that we accrue because of attachments in the world, they come ultimately, they come back to this idea of the sense of self. So that too is what, what we ultimately have to let go of if you want to uh, go deeper. Great. Thank you, Ajahn. There's a few questions coming in now. So the next one. Dear Ajahn, can you please explain why the teachings are the meaning of life? Why? Is it say again? Why are the teachings the meaning of life? Oh, uh, okay. Why are, the, why are the teachings the meaning of life? Okay. <laughs> Obvious, isn't it? It's not the meaning. I thought it was obvious. <laughs> no, why are they? You know, the answer is very. I think it often stares us in the face. What you need to ask yourself is what is it that you want? What is it that you want in your life? Yeah. And uh, often we don't really, I think, reflect properly on this. So this is kind of part of the problem. Huh? So what is it that we want? What is it that drives you in your life? What is it that always, what is it that, that motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? What is that motivates you to come on this little retreat? What is that motivates you to work hard, to do all the things that you do? And everything that drives you in your life is this wish to move towards something positive and away from the negative. Yeah, when you choose a partner in life, I don't know if you have a partner, but let's say you have a partner. Um, what, how do you choose that partner? Do you choose someone you like or do you choose someone you dislike? It's obvious, right? We always choose someone. When you choose a religion, do you choose a religion you think is nonsense or do you choose a religion which is meaningful to you? When you choose breakfast in the morning, do you choose something you hate or something you, you enjoy? Everything in our life, we're motivated by this search for happiness and avoidance of suffering, yeah? And the, the problem is that even though this is what motivates everything we do, yeah, and there is a, like a little voice in the back of our head that says that, well, if you get these things right, you get the right partner, you have the right meditation practice, you get the right house, you have the right career, then you will be satisfied. This little voice in our back of our head that keeps lying to us like that, yeah, telling us untruths, falsehoods, um, we, we need to kind of see through that lie. We need to understand, having tried this again and again so many times, uh, to understand actually it doesn't work. We don't get what we actually want. Uh, what we want is that real satisfaction, the real contentment, the end of the road when we don't have to search anymore. Uh, but actually our search is endless. We always move, try to move, uh, move towards something a goal that actually is unattainable because it cannot be attained in that way that we're trying to attain it. So we need to change our direction. We need to understand that uh, the problem is actually a psychological problem. 
there's something inside of us which is missing. Yeah, there's a lack inside of us that we can't really fulfill properly. And we cannot fulfill that lack through external things, through a career, through a, a partner, through a, um, a education, through status or whatever it might be, or through belongings or whatever. It cannot be fulfilled through that because it is an inner problem, something inside of us. Eventually, those external things might kind of be like a band-aid on the you know on the um, uh, the wound for a short while but then it doesn't really work anymore it's only a short-term kind of fix which disappears again because the inner problem is there so the buddha then says well to find that solution to the thing that we are searching for which is real happiness and contentment the real satisfaction uh, well, we don't have to search anymore uh, wouldn't that be nice not to have to search anymore uh, would that be nice to find that contentment in life? You don't have to keep on running around looking for, uh, you know, Santa Claus and Santa Claus is never there, whatever it is. And always running around for something which seems like this phantom, a phantom which is kind of unreachable. Wouldn't it be nice to one day find that perfect satisfaction? And that is what the Buddha promises us. Why? Well, because the happiness that comes through living a moral life is very different from the happiness of the things in the world. Things in the world don't affect us directly inside, whereas a moral life affects you psychologically. You start to feel happy. You start to feel content, content about yourself. You start to feel that, uh, you know, in an inner kind of happiness and purpose that you never had before. And then once you have, uh, once you start living the moral life, you start to understand actually there's a deeper aspect to this as well, and that is the aspect of meditation meditation practice. You take meditation into your life and that meditation gives an even deeper sense of satisfaction. Yeah, a sense of that you are starting to be fulfilled inside in a way that you have never been before. It's like that this hole inside of you, this itch that you always have to scratch but never stops itching. Suddenly it starts to get less. Yeah, it starts to disappear. You start to feel a completely fulfilling and satisfying happiness inside of you that you never felt before. And this is, of course, the end goal, the end purpose of samadhi practice itself. Samadhi, when you attain samadhi fully, the idea of samadhi is precisely that uh, uh, there is no movement in the mind anymore. You have this complete satisfaction within yourself. There's no need to go anywhere else. Yeah, and that complete satisfaction in, inside of yourself when there's no need to do anything else, it means that craving and desire has come to an end. And the reason it has come to an end is precisely because you found the full and final satisfaction inside. And you realize, yeah, when you come to these kind of stages, you realize this is what I was looking for all along. This is what the sensory world, I thought the sensory world was promising me this, but the sensory world was lying. It wasn't telling me the truth. The world outside could never deliver that. I was looking in the wrong place. I had to turn around to look inside instead, practice the Buddhist path, you know, practice the spiritual path, understand the nature of morality and samadhi. And that is where that satisfaction can be found. And when all craving is gone, which is the promise of deep samadhi and deep stillness, of course, there's no movement anymore. There's nothing more to do. Yeah, that's why you're perfectly content. When there's no craving, there's nowhere else to go. You're perfectly satisfied where you are. That is, that means by definition that you have found the meaning of life. All of that movement has finally come to a stop. You have found the goal that you thought was there available. You found it in a very different way through meditation practice. But there's one step more, and that one step more is the fact that even the samadhi experiences are only temporary here. They last for a short time. And then when you lose them, of course, then you come back to craving again. So there's one more step, and that one additional step is the step of insight. Yeah, when you see the nature of reality in such a way that that craving is given up once and for all. And then you are always satisfied. You're always content with whatever happens. And then all of that kind of running around the world, trying to find this uh, uh, phantom which doesn't exist in that world, uh, all of that comes to an end. Uh, and you have found that fulfillment, uh, satisfaction, uh, uh, true purpose inside of you instead.
That is why the Buddhist path is the answer to the meaning of life. Yeah, nothing else. This is the only place through the spiritual practice uh, you can find true meaning and true purpose. Uh, and this is what the Buddha promises you now. So what are you going to do? Uh, are you going to practice this or are you going to do things that are meaningless in the world? Uh, that is your choice. <laughs> so please, yeah, re re try to, re I don't know, it's to me, it's just so, it's so powerful, yeah, and so beautiful and so um, awesome when you really kind of Get it, uh, yeah, when you start to understand what this is about. What else are you going to do with your life? Uh, yeah? It seems like everything else becomes kind of silly in comparison. Uh, the more you think like this, the more committed you become. Uh, the more you persevere in these practices. The most difficult thing in, in Buddhist life is actually to persevere and commit. Uh, I'm sure Venerable Chanda and all of you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, this commitment and perseverance day in, day out, to kindness, to always doing the right thing. This is where it comes from. Uh, it comes from a real appreciation of what we're dealing with. Uh, if you know that you're dealing with the very meaning of life itself, uh, then of course the commitment, the perseverance, the perseverance, they arise out of that uh, because you understand how crucial this is, uh, how all-encompassing it is, uh, how, how everything else fades and uh, is pales by comparison. Uh, there is nothing quite like the Buddhist path. Uh, Okay. <laughs> I'm muted. Wonderful. We've got lots of questions coming in. So okay. um, I'm not sure we're going to get to everything. Uh, we'll do our best. There's a couple, two or three questions about fear. Um, someone's asking if meta is an antidote to fear, then what is the relationship between fear and ill will? And someone else is asking how to deal with the fear of not finding Dhamma again in the future. So two slightly yeah. different questions. <laughs> right. So what is the connection between fear and ill will? Well, um, I, I think generally speaking, if we, you know, people who have ill will also will tend to have fear because when you have ill will, we tend to see the world through our own personality. And if you have a lot of ill will yourself, you tend to see ill will in the world. And if the world has ill will, in other words, people around us have ill will, then the world is a bit more scary. Yeah, so we, uh, and, and that could come from ill will in the past, or it could come from ill will in the present life. Uh, but it is a, I think there is a quite close connection between the two. But um, there is another way, and that is one of the things that I've you know, learned from Ajahn Brahm, is this idea that fear is like a fault finding with the future. Yeah, and fault finding and ill will are very closely related to each other. Fault finding is almost like the foundation of ill will. You see a fault in somebody, and the more you focus on that, it ends up being ill will. And if you are fearful about the future, it means that you see all the problems in the future, yeah? Everything that can go wrong. So it is a bit like fault finding with the future. And the future looks scary because you're seeing the problems. So, so uh, I think the connection uh, can be quite uh, strong between the two. I'm sure there's other connections as well. It's not the, you know, I'm sure that there's all kinds of things going on there. For example, you might have ill will with yourself, you know, how often people are angry and upset with themselves. So, and uh, really, please get out of that. Don't be angry with yourself. Have compassion for yourself, for goodness sake. Yeah. We're all in this samsara together. We're all trying to do our very best. Uh, and life is difficult. Yeah, and people are judgmental and it's just so sometimes so unfair. But Remember that you and I and every one of us, we are conditioned into what we are. There's no point in blaming ourselves or blaming anyone. We are who we are because of cause and conditions. So for goodness sake, be kind to yourself, not only to yourself, but also to others. And I think that kindness will eliminate a lot of the, the fear right away because the world looks more beautiful when we are kind to others and to ourselves. Yeah? We have more hope in the world when we see the kindness around us. And there is a lot of kindness in the world. So uh, that, I think, is um, if you want to overcome the fear, kindness is almost always uh, the kind of the gradual way out of it. Uh, for some people, it is more difficult because of their past, whatever they may have done in the past. Uh, and for other people, it is easier to overcome. But it is always there to overcome, uh, gr gradually overcome. Um, I should also 
as, you know, say that because fear and anxiety are really about fault finding with the future, uh, remember to think about the good possible outcomes in the future. Yeah, remind yourself of the good outcomes. Uh, remind yourself of the, you know, the um, uh, what may happen in a positive sense. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, usually, if we are human beings, usually the outcomes are good. Yeah, usually things tend to go well. We live in this society. We are um, we are heading in the right way. We're kind of practicing a Buddhist path or at least a spiritual life. Yeah, so everything is really heading in the right way. Yeah? To good people, usually usually have good outcomes. Usually, good things will happen to us. So, so remember that, and then when you the more you remember that, the less there is to fear, yeah, because you know that you are living in the right way, very likely you will have a good outcome as a consequence. And one of the things you can do is to think about the worst possible outcome in the future. So what is the worst possible outcome? Maybe, let's say the worst possible outcome is that you will die, yeah, you will die tomorrow, maybe that is the worst possible outcome. Now, if you die tomorrow, but you have lived your life well, you have done the right thing, well, you don't have much to fear, yeah? Because good people, they tend to have a good rebirth when they die. So if, the, if dying is the worst possible outcome and dying isn't so bad, well then how much do you have to fear? There isn't all that much to fear there. So that is, um, I don't know, I, I'm not sure. those are a couple of ways of thinking about that problem of the fear about the, the future. Uh, and the connection with ill will. I'm not really sure. Uh, I'm sure there's many and many other ways of thinking about that. Uh, but uh, over to the other question, the fear about losing the Dhamma, because uh, we don't know how long the Dhamma is going to be around. And that is, a, I think, a very important question. And, and I think uh, it is a, a, a very pertinent. Yeah, the Dhamma seems to be declining around the world, if I'm going to you know, say what I observe anyway around me. And um, the way to deal with that is to remind yourself that this is just the nature of the world. This is part of the impermanence of everything. Everything comes and goes. Everything is subject. Everything is out of control. The Dhamma is out of control. We have no idea how long it's going to last. But instead of being fearful about it, remind yourself that what it really means is that now is the opportunity here. Yeah, now is the chance. Now is a chance to live in the right way, to do what is good. So don't allow the fear to paralyze you. Allow that little bit of fear or anxiety to become a spur for practice. And by practice, I mean, don't necessarily have to meditate enormous amounts, but be kind enormous amounts. Always be kind, always do the right thing. If you can allow that fear or that little bit of tinge of fear and anxiety to be stuck at the back of your mind, to guide you in daily life, to make your head in the right direction, then it can be very, very useful. So uh, I, absolutely, I think that is a very, it's a good way of thinking. Don't be too fearful about it, but use it as something positive to guide you in the right way. Okay. So I'm going to summarize the next question. So this person says that sometimes they use counting in the meditation, which helps the thoughts not to wander. And also they like the idea of metta, but they find it exhausting if they try to do too much breath counting or metta. Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for keeping the meditation practice um, in balance? Okay. Yes, it is exhausting to count the breath. <laughs> And uh, the Buddha doesn't really recommend that. It's not actually found in the Sutta. That is found in the, I think, in the Sutta Manga. They uh, uh, advise you count the breaths. So you can stick with it. And uh, ideally, the, um, the what we really should ideally do is to uh, have enough mindfulness so, so that the mind sticks to the breath without having to force it onto the breath, uh, force the mind onto the breath. Uh, Counting is really just a technique of using force, yeah? It's to kind of fix the mind onto the breath. The mind doesn't have a chance anymore to go where it wants it. And of course, it's gonna be tiring, it's gonna be exhausting because you are, it's like any kind of concentration exercise where you have to concentrate that it always is tiring at the end of the day. So ideally what you would want to do is to establish more mindfulness first. One of the things that we will see later on 
when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta and other suttas, is that the Buddha always says, establish mindfulness first. And if mindfulness really is established in the appropriate way, you don't have to count anymore because your mind will be present with the breath. Yeah? So this is kind of the, uh, uh, the ideal way of doing this. But uh, for many people, it does not work because mindfulness is not strong enough to be able to do that. Uh, if that is the case, basically what we have to do is we have to establish the foundation factors of the path more uh, to enable us to be able to stay with the breath uh, as it is, uh, yeah, without counting, without forcing the mind and all of these kind of things. Uh, then as those foundations become strong, it means we have less desire, less ill will, and we have to practice morality to a very deep level, then and gradually that mindfulness becomes established and gradually it becomes possible to do this. And in the meantime, uh, do meditations that work for you. Don't do things that are too difficult. Do meditations where maybe you are listening to a guided meditation that helps you to focus. Yeah. Do, as you say, metta meditation more because that also helps you maybe to focus a little bit. Uh, uh, do shorter meditations. Don't use it as a, you know, especially in everyday life when you, uh, it's very hard to focus because your mind is tired already. Don't use the counting because what you're doing is creating even more tiredness. Uh, allow yourself to rest properly in that meditation and use short meditations with guidance or whatever it is uh, so you can actually relax properly during that time. It's so important to enjoy the meditation. Meditation should add value to your life, not subtract value from your life. Yeah? You should have a better life as a consequence of it. Uh, and then uh, if you start your day with a little bit of meditation, then of course, and you feel better, it means you become a better person as a consequence. The same thing with the metta. Yeah? Again, don't force it too much. And one way of doing that is to use maybe some guidance in your metta meditation, just a voice that reminds you instead of you reminding yourself. If you have to remind yourself, then maybe again, uh, it's, uh, it's perhaps too much work. Yeah, I don't know. It really depends on the, on the situation. Uh, but uh, try to make it natural, uh, make it come automatically, yeah? establish the mind in the right way, get the mindfulness going first of all, establish some positive perceptions in your mind, metta comes from positive perceptions, yeah? if you think about people in a positive way, if you see their good qualities, the metta arises more easily, yeah? Yeah? so establish your mind in the right way, then do the metta meditation. And then hopefully it will, be, it will be less arduous and less uh, difficult for you. Great. So there are a couple of questions about um, kindness and how do we know that if what we're doing is really kind? For example, even when we think that we're benefiting ourselves and others, and um, maybe we're not really. So there are a couple <laughs> of questions like that. <laughs> uh, don't set the bar too high. Don't try to be an arahant straight away. Yeah, it takes a while to become an arahant. But you know, be happy with being a spear mentor or even less to begin with. Yeah. So don't uh, don't try too hard. Yeah. Try your best. Yeah. If you don't know, if you are uncertain about the purity of your motivations, then that's okay. Your motivations are not going to be absolutely pure straight away. It's okay to have grayish motivations. Yeah. Our job should be to move towards the lighter. Uh, spectrum of gray, lighter, lighter shades of gray, and you're heading in the right direction. So you try your very best, and then you learn as you go along. Yeah? You ask yourself, okay, what is my motivation in this case? Sometimes it's very obvious that you're being kind. Yeah? Sometimes it's just the, you know that you're coming from kindness. At other times, if you have doubts about, about it, you just do your best in that kind of situation. Sometimes it's obvious that you're not being kind, but that is what you want to avoid. So you just try to avoid that in the situation where you are, you know, where things are obviously not no good. So you lean in the right direction. And as you lean in the right direction, you gradually come to understand yourself. Yeah, you start, more and more you purify uh, your mind gradually, your, your motivations become more and more bright. And uh, so you keep on going in this way. You know, one of the things that I have often found myself is that uh, when we try to be kind, sometimes we try too hard to be kind without the feeling of kindness really being there. 
Now you, you force yourself, okay, I'm going to say something nice to this person. You kind of grit your teeth and you say something nice, even though you don't really feel like it or whatever. And that is not very pleasant. It's almost like you're doing an act of violence towards yourself when you do that. You don't really want to do that. So the ideal way of being kind is, first of all, to establish that sense of it wanting to be kind towards others. Uh, yeah, the idea of compassion or metta or whatever it is. Uh, and once that idea is established in your mind, kindness comes quite naturally. Uh, you don't have to force yourself. You may have to force yourself a little bit, uh, but not so much anymore. Uh, so try to always see if you can have more. Use your thinking mind to reflect in a positive way. Remember, reflection is a very, very important part of the Buddhist teachings. Uh, the Buddha says there are two powers, the power of reflection and the power of uh, development. Uh, development is meditation practice. Reflection is everything else. Uh, reflection is what leads you to being moral, to thinking in the right way. Uh, so use the power of reflection to look at people in a new way. Have more compassion for them. Uh, understand that everyone is mired in something. You all have more suffering than you're bargaining for in this life. Uh, yeah, I would like to hear from anyone on this retreat who has got enough suffering here. Uh, Please see me because that would be very interesting. Yeah. We all have plenty of suffering and look at the people around you. Remember that they too have exactly the same problem. Of course, they're going to do funny things sometimes when we have suffering in our lives. It's just natural. Man. When you see people do funny things that may seem bad, and maybe you have to bear the brunt of some of that bad conduct, and have compassion. Yeah, have understanding for them, be kind towards them. And once you understand, have compassion for them, then you can be kind. Also, see the good qualities in people around you. There's lots of good qualities in people around the world. Focus on that, develop that inside of you. See the good qualities. Because as you see the good qualities of, in people, that is when you have metta. Metta is very important to develop, not, not just compassion, but the metta side as well. Because the metta is a very pure, quality with very little downside to it yeah compassion sometimes you see too much suffering when you have compassion but with metta there is no real downside to see the beautiful qualities and people around and there's so many good qualities yeah look at all these people coming on retreats all these people listening to dhamma talks around the world all of these people want to do what is right all of these people want to do what is good in this world and there are millions of people like that out there yeah remember that and when you remember that Kindness comes more automatically. It comes from the heart. It comes from deep inside. You know it is more pure. You know you're coming from the right place. You don't have to force yourself so much anymore. So be kind, but also try to change the underlying uh, qualities inside of you. And then everything kind of comes uh, more easily as a consequence. Okay. Um, there were a couple of questions on how to overcome the fault-finding mind, but I think you've pretty much answered that, Ajahn, with the last uh, reflection you, you did about metta and about um, wise ways of reflecting in our everyday life. So maybe, yeah, there's also a request from four people um, for some death contemplation meditation at some point during this retreat, which I can imagine that you were going to do. <laughs> and... So can we have your approval for that? Absolutely, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so could you take one more little question perhaps before we end this session? Of course. Great. So this one's about sensual pleasures and someone is asking, is the danger of enjoying sensual pleasures in moderation equal to the danger of indulging in sensual pleasures to excess? <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I think sometimes we get the idea of uh, the sensual world slightly in the, uh, in the wrong way. The, the, the biggest problem is not so much the sensual pleasures. I know this is a standard translation that you find in the suttas. And, uh, the word karma in Pali is always translated as sensual pleasures. But I think this misleading, what the karma really refers to is the entire sensory world. Yeah. It means attachment to that world and indulgence in that world to an excessive amount. Of course, if we indulge in that world, if we find too much happiness in that world, then we're going to attach because attachment and desire, they go hand in hand. So it's going to be problematic. So, uh, uh, but don't worry too much if you, have, if you enjoy some of the aspects of that world. For example, if you enjoy good food, yeah, is it going to be a big hindrance? 
Probably not. It's only going to be a hindrance if you think about food in your meditation. Do you think about food in your meditation? I don't know. I, I, I have no idea what people do, but I never think about food in my meditation. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. And so even though I enjoy my meal, it, I, it's no problem. Yeah. It's not really an issue because I don't think about it afterwards. So, so that is how you decide whether it is a problem for you or not. One of the a sutta that I found very interesting is a sutta where the Buddha talks about someone who attains deep samadhi and how they relate to the sensory world. And he says that if someone comes out of a very deep jhana state and afterwards they have a nice meal, well, that meal seems, even if it is this ordinary, very basic meal with broken rice and porridge, I think that's what it says in the sutta. <laughs> I don't know what broken rice is, but anyway, broken rice and porridge. It feels like a king's feast, is what it says, because your senses are so heightened, yeah? So you actually enjoy, it's weird, yeah? You enjoy the sensory world more if you have a deep meditation experience. And one of the reasons is precisely because there is no craving. It's kind of strange. There's nothing really wrong with enjoying the sensory world. It's how we enjoy that matters. Of course, so that's about food, yeah? With entertainment, it's a bit more tricky because with entertainment, it tends to draw us out ourselves. We lose a, a sense of um, a sense restraint and it kind of it tends to reverberate in the mind afterwards. So entertainment is a bit more tricky. So there you have to use it wisely, yeah? So maybe listen to some nice music to calm you down if it is a peaceful kind of music. I think that is okay. But you have to see how it impacts your mind, yeah? And then, gradually kind of find these things in the right way. Uh, when it comes to uh, other things, basically uh, you have to use these things in a wise way. Yeah, This is kind of the, uh, the, the, the biggest issue. So look at how it affects your mind. Try to understand what the problems are. The way I often deal with it is I try to kind of think of the whole sensory world in one kind of big block the whole sensory world as problematic. I don't think, I don't look so much about individual desires. Of course, you know, sometimes you have desires which are not really ideal, but um, uh, you try to look at the whole sensory world and you kind of, to me, rejecting the whole sensory world in one block, I found that the most effective to kind of encourage meditation going in the right way. Not necessarily focusing so much on individual desires depending on how problematic they are. So this is something that you have to, I guess, experiment a little bit with yourself. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the uh, meditations that Buddha talks about in the suttas is called the Sambhaloka Anabhidhati Sanya, which means the perception of non-delight in the whole world. We take the whole world like in one sensory block. We see the whole thing as problematic and then you move more towards the world of the mind in a sense, uh, 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 the, the world of the mind instead. And then you are, I think, uh, uh, possibly on the right track. You can try that. I often find that more easy to do. But a lot of these things depends on your life situation, all kind of things, uh, how this is going to work out. Uh, so you have to try a little bit, a little bit of a trial and error, hopefully mostly trial, not so much error, but you, everyone does a bit of error sometimes. Uh, so check it out, try it out. Uh, and see uh, what works for you, and then you should be on the right track. Okay. Okay. Sad, sad, sad. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So, thank you very much, Ajahn Gamali. And uh, now is the time to uh, let you go. So please okay. take your leave and uh, I'll just say a few words to the others before you right. go, uh, after you go, Ajahn. Very good. See you again tomorrow. Take care.